evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Lisa Alaferis, health editor at KQED News and your moderator for tonight's program. Today's program is underwritten by the California Healthcare Foundation. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org and the foundation at chcf.org. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Otis Brawley. He is on, an oncologist with a dazzling clinical research and policy career. Dr. Brawley is professor of medicine at Emory University, chief medical officer at the American Cancer Society, and co-author of How We Do Harm, a doctor breaks ranks about being sick in America. How We Do Harm exposes the underbelly of healthcare today. Dr. Brawley reveals the overtreatment of the rich, the undertreatment of the poor, the financial conflicts of interest that determine the care that doctors provide, and pharmaceutical companies concerned with selling drugs regardless of whether they improve health or harm real patients. And the public is not off the hook either. He details an American populace primed to swallow the latest pill no matter the cost, and in some cases, even if they are explicitly told, even by Dr. Brawley himself, that it will not help them. Brawley calls for rational health care, health care drawn from evidence-based medicine. Brawley's personal history stretches from a childhood in the gang-ridden streets of black Detroit to the institutional green hallways of Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta, that's the largest public hospital in the country, and on to the boardroom of the American Cancer Society. His book reflects his passionate view of medicine and the politics of illness in America, as well as a deep understanding of healthcare today. How We Do Harm is a well-reasoned manifesto for change. Dr. Otis Brawley, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the book came about because about three years ago, I uh, was uh, brought back into the US Public Health Service and uh, loaned to the Navy for a few months during the surge. And I was a ship's doctor out in the Pacific Ocean. And I, uh, as has already been alluded, grew up in the inner city of Detroit. I was fortunate that uh, while I grew up in a very rough area, I was always smart and I was always supported, even occasionally by some gang members and drug dealers who'd occasionally give me $20 or $50 and knew I wasn't going to spend it on weed. And I got sent to uh, a very good high school, a Jesuit high school in the city of Detroit, and I was exposed to some very good men, some very good Jesuit priests who taught me how to think, how to question, and how to be contemplative. They also taught me to be an advocate for what is right, uh, to be an advocate for what is right no matter what the cost. There was Father Fallon, who was a sort of in-your-face guy who uh, I can remember when I was 13 years old, I had never seen a priest cuss before, but he kept telling me that the greatest word in the English language started with an S and ended with a T, and then he stood up in front of the class and jumped up and down and just started screaming it. Uh, Father Polakowski, who was an incredibly witty guy who um, actually, when I went to medical school, told me one thing that has always stuck with me, and that is that uh, always remember what you know, what you don't know, and what you believe, and always remember that doctors tend to confuse what they believe with what they know. Uh, both, and indeed the entire Jesuit community, pushed me toward a sense of right and wrong and a sense of outing. Indeed, Father Fallon was probably the most in-your-face person I'd ever met in terms of outing injustices. As I grew and went to medical school, went through the University of Chicago, I ended up with a number of individuals who uh, very much inspired me, very much encouraged me, very much helped me. And again, that moral compass continued. I went to the National Cancer Institute and trained in medical oncology and epidemiology and got very interested in what was called special populations research for a time. And then uh, it was called minority health. And then for political reasons, David Satcher changed it to health disparities. He literally said, I want to see a congressman stand up and say, I'm against programs to reduce disparities in health. <laughs> 
And so we started calling it health disparities or disparities in health. And I began uh, my career as an epidemiologist, and I realized that the problem in the United States is some people consume too much medicine and unnecessary care is given. Some people don't consume enough, that is, necessary care is not given. And we actually could decrease the waste and improve overall health in the United States if we just got rational about how we practice medicine. Over the years, I uh, worked at the National Cancer Institute, and then I went on to uh, uh, Emory University in Atlanta. I became director of the Cancer Center at the uh, county hospital there. And I met, uh, I've always tried to learn from my patients. Indeed, uh, I was taught at a very early age in medical school that a smart doctor always learns from his patients. I remember in 2002, uh, a woman in a very smart business suit walked into our county hospital with her husband. And there were two things there that were unusual, smart business suit and somebody coming in with their spouse. And her story was especially touching to me. Helen, who I'll, I'll call her, was a black woman. At that time, she was about 61, 62 years old. In 1989, she found a mass in her breast. Uh, she went to her gynecologist. Her gynecologist sent her to a surgeon, a breast surgeon. The breast surgeon did a biopsy along with a mammographer, and they determined that she had breast cancer. They offered her a lumpectomy and radiation or a mastectomy. This is all good medicine. Helen is a black woman with some college education. She and her husband in 1989 were actually relishing in the fact that they were actually getting good care, something that blacks in Atlanta didn't get prior to about 1980, which is when uh, Emory University Hospital, one of my hospitals, actually finally integrated by race. Many people don't realize it was 1980, it wasn't 1965, that many of the hospitals in the South actually integrated. So she was just thrilled that, you know, it, she could actually get good care now. It had only been 10 years. She got her surgery, and she had two nodes positive, two out of 18 nodes positive. And her doctor, her medical oncologist, who was one of the finest medical oncologists in the southeastern United States, recommended that she get a high-dose chemotherapy with a bone marrow transplant. The idea very quickly is since chemotherapy drugs do shrink the tumor, but they don't cure the cancer in normal dose, if we give the person really high doses, maybe it'll kill the cancer. Well, the bone marrow is an innocent bystander, so what they do, or what we used to do, is take the bone marrow out, store it in a freezer, and then give the high-dose chemotherapy. When the high-dose chemotherapy cleared the person's system, then we would give them their bone marrow back. This is a procedure that actually was developed by some doctors in Boston in the early 1980s. And you know, doctors in Boston are very smart, so everything that they suggest must be right. <laughs> it turns out that in the 1980s and early 1990s, a number of insurances didn't want to pay for this because there was no study to show that it was beneficial to the patient, that is. Uh, Many women sued their insurance companies to get their insurance companies to pay for this procedure. Uh, 10 state legislatures actually passed laws and 10 governors actually signed bills such that in 10 states in the United States to this day, it is illegal for an insurance company to not pay for this procedure. Keep in mind the National Cancer Institute, which in 1989 I actually worked for, was actually trying to organize a study to see if this thing was beneficial. There was no study to show that this thing was beneficial, but people were suing their insurances and everybody was getting bone marrow transplant. Well, she got her bone marrow transplant. Her insurance actually was willing to pay for it. She had every side effect known to man. It led to an 18-month hospitalization. She had three cardiac arrests. She was on a ventilator for six months. She had a tracheostomy because of the ventilator for so long. She had pneumonias, numerous issues, blood clots. But she survived. She did very well. She went back to work. 
And every year, she and her husband would celebrate the day that she was diagnosed with breast cancer and all the good care that she got. And then in 2001, she developed a cough. Went to her old oncologist. He did a chest x-ray. There was something there. They finally were able to figure out it was breast cancer back in her lung. She started treatment with him, and then one day she got a registered letter in the mail from her insurance company. It informed her that she had maxed out on the amount of money that they were going to pay for her health care. She had reached the lifetime maximum, which for her was actually high. It was $2 million. Most people, it's only a $1 million. And so she came to see us at the county hospital because she had been labeled uninsurable. And you see, folks, there's this thing called the HIPAA law that everybody thinks about privacy. Well, there's two Ps there. One is portability. The law actually allows insurances to tell other insurances how much money they had spent on you. And so her insurance company told all other insurance companies she's uninsurable. Don't insure her. So. All of this spectacular treatment caused her to be uninsurable. Now, when she met me, she actually was interviewing me for a job to be her doctor. This was a lady who was in control. And she asked me if I ever did bone marrow transplant. I said no. And then she quizzed me further, because she wanted me to know. She wanted to know if I knew in 1999, Almost 10 years after she got her bone marrow transplant, almost 20 years after we started bone marrow transplant in the United States, three clinical trials were published, all of which showed that bone marrow transplant was net harmful. It generally increased risk of death by about 5%. You see, for 20 years, we did bone marrow transplant because some smart people from Boston said it was a good idea. Indeed, in 1999, within four months, the 220 bone marrow transplant centers in the United States all closed. There were over 65,000 women who got transplanted in the United States in the 1990s, all with no data to show it was beneficial to other than the doctors in the hospitals who did the procedures and collected money for doing the procedures. <laughs> Then let me go back to Mr. Hujek. Mr. Hujek was an auto worker from Cleveland who I met in the middle of the night when I was a second year resident uh, at Case Western Reserve University. He's brought in by his family. He had had widely metastatic, not small cell lung cancer for about nine months, which is about the median survival. He was brought in because he was totally unresponsive with the exception of, we've, we later found out if you stick a needle in him, he would grunt. But he was totally non-responsive. For the next two months that I knew this gentleman, he was totally non-responsive except when we stuck needles in him. He had had cisplatinum and etoposide, which is the only chemotherapy at the time for widely metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, and it had not worked. His tumor had grown through it. He had a good medical oncologist who tried to talk to the family, but the family would not listen. There was a daughter who basically ran the family, two sons who took orders from the daughter, and the daughter decided it was time to bring him into the hospital that night, and she wanted further treatment. There was no real further treatment for the cancer. He uh, had a low-grade fever. There, he was unresponsive. If we were to do things for him, he would. St if we actually were able to figure this problem out, we still couldn't stop the cancer. This is a gentleman who his oncologist had tried to convince the family should have comfort measures only. But that night at 2 o'clock in the morning, I remember having a conversation with the daughter, and uh, she said, I want everything done for him. And I said, naively, you mean everything reasonable? And she said, everything is reasonable. <laughs> and so for the next uh, almost two months, uh, that night, as a matter of fact, we started out with the lumbar punctures, the sticking needles into his chest to draw fluid off, we call that a thoracentesis, the uh, CT scans, the Doppler studies, uh, the numerous things that we did, 
uh, with the medical students and residents. And part of me, I still have post-traumatic shock over thinking about what we did to this poor man that we should have just kept comfortable. He lived for almost eight weeks, and in the end, he was in an intensive care unit. He had had numerous uh, cardiac arrests and been resuscitated successfully, only to have more cardiac arrests. He had had a thalamic stroke and had lost control of his temperature. He was on a ventilator. He was uh, septic and on levofed and dopamine. And one morning, I realized that this black kid from Detroit was sitting at the foot of the bed of this Slavic factory worker from Cleveland who probably didn't like the idea of a black guy being in the room. And I was about to tell the nurse what his vital sign should be that day. You see, since he had stroked out his thalamus, he was in a water bed where we controlled the temperature. Since he had stroked out, or he had had an MI and had lost his AV node, we had an artificial pacer in his neck down into his heart so I could set his heart rate. On the ventilator, I could set how much air he breathed in and how much he breathed per minute or how many times he inhaled per minute, and then with the levofed and dopamine, if I dialed it to the right, his blood pressure went up. If I dialed it to the left, his blood pressure went down. This poor man existed in this state for almost two months, and then uh, finally, several days after that, he mercifully had an arrest, and we could not bring him back. We spent probably three quarters of a million dollars over two months on this poor man, and the nurses, the priest, the doctors, even other patients couldn't convince the family, let's just keep him comfortable. Unfortunately, Mr. Hujik is not the only time I've gone through that in my career. And then there was Ralph. Ralph was a guy who called me in 2003 because I'd been outspoken about prostate cancer. Ralph was a wonderful human being. He and I had a lot in common. He was a white guy from Indiana. I was a black guy from Detroit. It's still the Midwest. But Ralph had actually had a Jesuit education as well. Ralph and I used to tell Jesuit stories and compare them and actually compare them to James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's a book where James Joyce criticized his own Jesuit education and its required reading in Jesuit high schools. <laughs> Ralph had uh, been forced to go to a local, uh, a local mall for prostate cancer screening by his wife. She had seen this advertisement from this hospital that they were having free prostate screening. He didn't want to go, but she forced him to go. Then he had an abnormal uh, measurement and he went to this doctor's office where he was referred to, and everybody in the waiting room had been screened at that same place. He didn't like that place, so he went someplace else. He went across town to this young guy who had this new Da Vinci robot, and his hospital was advertising him. He liked this guy, and he got the Da Vinci robotic prostatectomy for prostate cancer. He had one out of 12 biopsies positive with 20% having Gleason 3 plus 3 uh, disease. In my Forrest Gump life, and by the way, if you've ever read the book, The Emperor of All Maladies, I do sort of think of myself as Forrest Gump because about three quarters of the people in that book I know personally. One of them is a guy named Don Gleason who did the Gleason scoring for prostate cancer. And he never wanted Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer to be called cancer. He called it adenosis. You see, Don used to say, people want to cut cancer out, so I want to call this adenosis. And unfortunately, the urologists, the surgeons, the treaters overruled this pathologist and called it cancer. Well, Ralph had this cancer. He got it cut out with the Da Vinci robot. And then uh, his PSA didn't go down. Well, he's a smart guy, college educated. His prostate's in a bottle in somebody's lab and he still has PSA in his blood. He must have cancer somewhere. So he starts freaking out. And he goes doctor shopping, and he finally finds a radiation oncologist who for $80,000 billed to his uh, insurance gives him IMRT, basically radiation to the pelvis blindly. It's sort of a shotgun blast. Maybe we'll hit cancer there. 
Unfortunately, Ralph ends up with every side effect you can imagine. And when Ralph called me to talk to me about my feelings about prostate cancer screening, he had an ostomy on the left to collect stool and an ostomy on the right to collect urine because he had had a, uh, a pelvic dissection. Uh, it was terrible. And Ralph and I talked about prostate cancer screening. He asked me why was I so outspoken about prostate screening, and I explained to him I had been an aide to David Satcher when he was Surgeon General. I got to go to the apology at Tuskegee, or the uh, President Clinton's apology for the Tuskegee syphilis experiment at the White House. Now, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was a period of about 40 years where the U.S. government lied to about 700 men. And uh, two weeks after that, I was back at the National Cancer Institute and I went to see a cancer center. When the guy from the NCI, the federal government agency that gives out millions of dollars, goes to a cancer center, they have this dog and pony show that they put on. Well, in the intermission, I happened to be sitting next to a marketing guy. That's when I realized that marketing people are evil. <laughs> this marketing guy started talking about their prostate cancer screening program at the hospital. And you see, he could explain to me that if they announced that they were going to screen 1,000 men six weeks from now at a certain mall, he knew how much extra business they're going to get in their breast cancer clinic from mammography because women would go there because that hospital cares so much about their men, they're taking their mammogram business there. He knew how much extra business they're going to get in their chest pain clinic. He knew how much extra publicity they were going to get for free. It would cost X if we went to NPR, but if we announced we're doing free prostate screening, we're going to get it for free. Once they got to the mall, and they screened 1,000 guys who volunteer over the age of 50. Their previous year's data for several years showed that 135 would have an abnormal screen and come to their hospital to figure out why it was abnormal. He even knew 10 additional would have an abnormal screen and would go to their competition. But they would get 135, charge an average of $3,000 to figure out why the PSA was abnormal. Of the 135, 45 would actually have prostate cancer. Of the 45 with prostate cancer, he knew the percentage that would get surgery, the percentage that would get radiation, the percentage that would get cryosurgery, that's another thing that we used to do with no data and have stopped doing, by the way. He knew all this stuff. And then he tells me, you know, if we screen 1,000 guys and diagnose this 135 with an abnormal PSA and diagnose 45 with prostate cancer, this is the number of artificial sphincters we're going to sell because this is the number of guys who are going to have incontinence to the point that diapers just don't hack it for them. And then he apologized to me. There's this new thing called Viagra on the market. That screwed up his estimate of how many penile implants he was going to sell for, uh, for impotence. But he's talking to me. I'm an epidemiologist from the National Cancer Institute. <laughs> I asked the money question. Well, it turns out it wasn't really the money question. I asked. If you screen 1,000 guys, how many lives will you save? He took his glasses off, looked at me like I was a fool, and he said, don't you know? There's never been a study to show this stuff saves lives. I can't give you an estimate on that. And I, it took me a second. You know, I'm from Detroit. I'm a little slow. It took me a second to realize this guy knows how many artificial sphincters he's going to sell if he screens 1,000 people. He knows how much money he's going to make if he screens 1,000 people, but he doesn't know if he's going to save a single life. It turns out that the data of the show calculate how much harm is done from prostate cancer screening to this day is actually better than the data on how much good is done. As a matter of fact, I was looking at, just recently, recommending for informed decision-making on the question of prostate screening within the physician-patient relationship, the American Cancer Society that I work for, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, those are the cancer centers of the world, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, the European Urology Association, the American Urological Association. 
the surgeons. Recommending against routine screening are the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the Canadian Task Force on the Periodic Health Exam, the American College of Preventive Medicine, and the American College of Physicians. By the way, the uh, American Urological Association recommendation for screening, which I actually like a lot, says, given the uncertainty that PSA testing results in more benefit than harm, a thoughtful and broad approach to PSA screening is critical. Patients need to be informed of the risks and benefits of testing before it is undertaken. The risks of overdetection and overtreatment should be included in this discussion. That's what the American Urological Association says. Despite that, there's all this free testing that's still being done at all of these hospitals. There's actually one group that has vans that have been purchased by Kimberly Clark that goes around the various doctor groups and does free screening in supermarket parking lots. And in the summertime, they go around to state fairs. Why does Kimberly Clark buy these vans? I don't know if prostate cancer screening saves lives, but it sure as hell sells adult diapers. Kimberly Clark makes Depends undergarments. Lung cancer screening. There's been a prospective randomized trial of lung cancer screening that says that if you screen 27,000 people at high risk for lung cancer because they smoke more than 30 pack years, 30, that's a pack per day for 30 years, you actually save 84 lives, but you cause instrumentation that kills 16. Now, that's science. We at the ACS recommend that people who have an extensive smoking history realize the double-edged sword of screening. It, yes, it saved 84 people, but it caused 16 people to die a premature death. By the way, there were still 340 who died of lung cancer over 10 years. If you want to get screened, you should get screened. That's what we at the ACS says. St. Joseph's Hospital in Atlanta has ads right now recommending that non-smoking women in their 40s who have lived in an urban area for more than 10 years get screened because they say, according to St. Joseph's Hospital, they're at high risk for lung cancer. Their business plan actually involves the fact that 25% of all non-smokers will have a false positive exam and your insurance will pay to figure out why that exam was false positive. You see, we have in this country a form of corruption in medicine. And actually, we allow it all to happen. This corruption, who's at fault? It's the doctors, the hospitals, the insurance companies, the lawyers, the patients, patient advocacy groups, we all accept it. We all accept not being scientific, not being rational. We keep talking about rationing of health care in the United States. We need to be talking about rational use of health care. If we had been rational, bone marrow transplant would have only been available through a clinical trial in the 1980s and would never have been offered in the 1990s. I've come to realize when you're talking to doctors, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. That was Upton Sinclair, by the way. Let me bash a drug company real quick. <laughs> Prilosec, great drug. AstraZeneca had one problem. Four years left on the patent. They started this thing called Operation Shark Fin. Operation Shark Fin was to find a new drug. Well, it turns out they figured out, they had a chemist who had a law degree, and it turns out that Prilosec is really one drug, but it's a three-dimensional thing, so it's really two molecules. And we, in chemistry, they call them left and right-handed. Just like your left hand and right hand are mirror images of each other. Well, it turns out the left-handed molecule suppresses acid. The right-handed molecule in Prilosec your kidney does a wonderful thing. It urinates it away because it's inert. It doesn't do anything. What did they do? They created a new drug, happened to be the active ingredient, and Perilosec got a new 18-year patent. What did they call it? Nexium, the big purple pill, the marketing guys again. Perilosec is now a generic. Nexium is one of the 10 most prescribed drugs in the United States at $6 a pill, $180 a month. 
generic Prolisec is available for 25 cents a pill. Less than 10 bucks a month. Why is it that one of the 10 most prescribed drugs in the United States is on the market because AstraZeneca sent three studies to the FDA showing it is equivalent to Prilosec, okay? This is how we get totally irrational and we start accepting this. It's really the greedy feel, feeding the gluttonous. There are many people who want Nexium because it's the new drug, it must be better, not because the package insert says it's on the market because it's equivalent to Prilosec. You don't have to look far, folks. We need rational medicine. In the history of medicine, we've done so many things. Hysterectomy, C-section, carotid endorectomy, bypass, we've overdone them. Erythropoietin, there's just numerous examples and numerous examples. Why is it that our healthcare bill is $2.6 trillion in 2010? $2.6 trillion is a lot of money, by the way. The Entire gross domestic product of France, the sixth largest country in the world, is $2.55 trillion. 18 cents out of every dollar in the United States is spent on health care, and we are 49th in life expectancy. We are 44th in infant mortality. We are not getting what we pay for. We have the most expensive economy for healthcare in the world. And the last thing I'm gonna say before I open it up to questions is, the average cost of a healthcare plan for a family is $19,000 today. The American Cancer Society, we have a couple of thousand employees. We have people who get paid $25,000 a year in clerical work but we end up paying $19,000 a year for their insurance. If you look at the number two country in the world for expenses, it's Switzerland, where that healthcare policy would cost $11,000 a year. There are a whole bunch of folks in the United States, companies with 60 and 80 employees that provide healthcare to their employees, who if healthcare costs were half what they are in the United States today, equivalent to the second most expensive country in the world, they would actually employ a few extra people. That 60 or 80 person company might employ three or four extra people if health insurance costs were less. You see, health insurance and overconsumption and gluttony, which exists in the United States and nowhere else, not in Canada, which is 10th in life expectancy, but in the United States, which is 49th in life expectancy, this gluttony is destroying the country. And it's simply being irrational and not following the science. You won't find Nexium being sold in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brawley. He is professor of medicine at Emory University, chief medical officer, and executive vice president at the American Cancer Society, and co-author of How We Do Harm, A Doctor Breaks Ranks About Being Sick in America. I'm Lisa Alaferis, health editor at KQED, and now it's time for our audience question period. And Dr. Brawley, we've had several questions about what to do. We've had a question from the audience about, is Medicare the solution? A question yeah. from, if everything were reallocated, would we, would we have enough money to serve everyone? What do we do? If everything were reallocated and we reallocated it and did it in a rational way, we could actually save an awful lot of money and we could have much better outcomes. Uh, I am not optimistic, however, you know. The, health, the thing that I didn't say is the gross domestic product in the United States is growing at a pace right now where by 2025, a quarter out of every dollar will be spent on health care, and by 2050, it'll be well over 50 cents out of every dollar spent on health care. That's growth that's not sustainable. And so I do think we're gonna have health care reform. I think we'll have health care reform when our economy collapses because of the weight of health care. 
Uh, unfortunately, I do not think that we have enough courage to actually do the health care reform that we really need, which is really transforming how we view health care. And it's going to take everybody, the doctors, the lawyers, the patients, the hospitals, the insurance companies, everybody's got to buy into this. Let's practice medicine rationally. There are going to have to be some limits. There's already rationing going on in the United States. There will have to be some rationing. We're going to have to say no to some people in terms of some treatments. We're going to have to say, if you want to stay in the hospital for two extra weeks after your hip replacement, you're going to have to pay for it out of your pocket. Your insurance won't pay for it. Um, we also have several questions related to how much can informed patients drive this? We have quite, you know, there are a lot of, there's an e-patient movement, there's, uh, there are a lot of people who believe in market reforms that if patients had uh, yeah. more fiscal and more monetary involvement in having to make selections about treatments, how much can patients, can consumers by themselves do? I think that if patients have some skin in the game, meaning they have to pay some out-of-pocket expenses, that they actually will be a little bit more conservative in how they actually uh, consume health care. Not too long ago, I was at a, uh, a pharmacy, and this lady uh, was told by a pharmacist that the drug that she wanted, uh, she could get over the counter for $12, but if she fill the prescription, it would cost her insurance company about $80. And she explained that she had a $10 copay, so she wanted to get the prescription. Never mind, it would cost her insurance the extra 70 bucks. Um, I do believe that we're going to have to have, in many instances, certain types of uh, rules about this is going to be treated in this way, and then ultimately we're going to stop, especially in cancer. Uh, there will have to be, unfortunately, I think, some rationing. Uh, there's going to have to be, I do think that patients need to be involved and need to be asking, is this right for me? Especially if people had asked questions about bone marrow transplant as opposed to just accepting what they heard about bone marrow transplant, maybe fewer women would have been transplanted and fewer women would have been harmed. I would I would argue on that point though that it's it's pretty hard for a woman facing for anyone facing a scary diagnosis to challenge a physician who's saying we've done this we're getting good results we're uh, you know it it makes sense intuitively this is the yeah. problem with a lot of things is they make plenty of sense intuitively I, I accept exactly what you're saying and maybe the answer is that everybody ought to have a health coach who is separately involved financially in the decisions about treatment. Uh, I accept that what you're saying is absolutely true. It's very difficult and a very emotional thing to be told you that you have a devastating disease, be it cancer or anything else. Now get yourself together and figure out exactly how you're going to tackle this problem. So, uh, which gets at the concept of shared decision making, which is also uh, gaining momentum. But, yes. that, but that depends upon doctors then being willing to engage with their patients. Yeah, in, in prostate cancer screening, uh, many have interpreted me as being against prostate cancer screening, which I am not. I, my campaign has been against doctors not fully informing people of everything, but telling them that prostate cancer screening was definitely good. By the same token, I don't think we should say it's definitely bad either. Okay. Uh, we have a bit of a challenge here from someone in the audience. Um, how did you become chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society? The American Cancer Society is more responsible for excess screening in the U.S. than any other single group. I'm actually not going to walk away from that. Uh, <laughs> I actually believe that, you know, my views, I had written over 150 papers when I was hired as Chief Medical Officer of the American Cancer Society. I believe that the Chief Executive Officer and the Board knew exactly what they were getting and that they wanted to move in the direction of being much more uh, honest. I will also say that some of the messaging in the 1950s was very appropriate for the 1950s, but as technology evolved in the 60s and 70s, those messages did not evolve. 
And uh, I think if you look at our screening messages, in uh, actually go, go to my predecessor, go 10 years ago. If you look at our screening messages, I can stand behind those screening messages. In 1997 is when the American Cancer Society started recommending informed decision making for prostate cancer, although I still hear people to this day say that we recommend that all men get screened for prostate cancer. It hasn't been true for 15 years. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay. Um, I, I have a question here that I'm, I'm trying. Um, in your example of a family requesting or demanding everything be done to not to not offer everything not rational, um, doctors are going to be sued. So if you were to to stop, doctors doctors are sued. Families uh, have much more complicated grief. They feel like something somehow this death could have been avoided. Is there any way to, to change legal and financial systems so in, in those kinds of situations to support withholding interventions well, that do, do not have benefit? I do believe that legal and financial systems need to be changed and that they are part of the problem in medicine. But I think the greater problem in Mr. Hujik's family was uh, a problem that I see a lot in the United States. You know, There are cities in the country where every death has to be somebody's fault. Uh, you know, if you go to the northeastern United States, people are never supposed to die. We have to, we, we actually have to change our view. Part of my idea of transformation is changing our view of how we deal with death and dying. And in some instances, we're culturally going to have to accept that there are limits as to, uh, 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 there are limits to life. So you've, you mentioned uh, how there were, with the um, uh, bone marrow transplants for breast cancer, that there were laws passed to require insurance companies. And we're seeing a, a similar, similar laws passed today around the issue of breast density, which we have. I, yes. I have this question, and there's an audience question from this as well. Yeah. What, what do you think about those laws? What do you think about what women with bre death, dense breasts should be told? The problem, with, the problem with the breast density laws is we don't actually have in medicine an objective measure of breast density yet that everyone can agree upon. And then the second thing is density is very much in the eye of the beholder. What is a dense breast to one radiologist is not a dense breast to another. Yet all of a sudden we have laws in several states that, in some states they actually, they actually mandate in the law the subsequent testing you have to do on a woman who has been informed she has a br dense breast. Uh, I think when you're starting to legislate medicine, and the experts in medicine don't even know exactly what you should be doing. You're in really, you're really on shaky ground. That's happened here in California just very recently. Um, now that being said, I do believe that doctors ought to, part of the problem is a communications issue between doctors and the patients. I do believe that doctors should talk to patients about their density even though we at this point don't have an objective way to standardize density measurements. So in other words, I, a physician should tell a patient that you have a condition that I really can't uh, tell you what it really means. That's what it kind of sounds like you're saying. Well, unfortunately, that's exactly what's been legislated. That's so. exactly what's been legislated. And uh, what I'm saying is rather that, what I'm saying is that I do believe that doctors should discuss the density issue with their patients, should make patients aware that this issue of density is something that we're trying to figure out, should make patients aware of the fact that the federal government and state governments that have cancer programs like California are not funding programs to figure it out. They're legislating that you must tell patients they have it. Um, and I, I actually think that doctors should be honest about what the situation actually is. And uh, getting back to Father Polakowski, uh, I actually think one of the problems that doctors have is we cannot say, I don't know. It's just not allowable. We need to start being able to say, I don't know. 
Um, this is rather a, a really uh, quite a wrenching uh, qu question here. I was misdiagnosed with brain cancer recently and suffered the agony of the diagnosis and worrying about surviving brain cancer surgery, et cetera. Uh, do you have stats on cancer misdiagnosis and unnecessary surgeries? I don't have... I don't have stats on misdiagnosis as much as I have stats on unnecessary surgery. Uh, there's this thing called overdiagnosis, which many people don't totally comprehend, and that is something that actually looks like cancer under the microscope. A pathologist who looks at it will actually say this is cancer, but that cancer is not genetically or genomically programmed to grow, spread, metastasize, and harm. Indeed, in uh, prostate cancer, uh, we know that of men who have localized disease, it's, it's more than half have an overdiagnosis cancer, where if nothing is done, God's great plan is they grow old and die of something totally unrelated, but we can cure them in the meantime. <laughs> um, in breast cancer, we argue as to whether it's 10 to 30 percent of localized breast cancers are overdiagnosis cancers. There's an article recently in The Lancet that suggests it may be even more than that. And how we got into this, I actually think, is important. If I can take 45 seconds. Our definitions of cancer were given to us by some German pathologists. Uh, Virchow was one of the leaders of this group in the mid-1800s. And what they did was autopsies on people who died from cancer. And they took biopsies and they used a new machine uh, called a dermatome to slice these things very carefully. They used these new chemicals called H and E stains to stain them and then they use light microscopes with candles at that time. These were microscopes were relatively new to actually draw what we now call cancer. They drew pictures and they said this is cancer. Nowadays uh, these women all died of metastatic disease. These men all died of metastatic disease. Nowadays, uh, in the case of breast cancer, with a mammogram machine that was invented after I was born, with an ultrasound machine that was invented and patented after I graduated from high school, and with needle biopsy technology that was actually patented this century, a pathologist near here, in a hospital near here, today localized an eight millimeter, less than one centimeter lesion in a woman's breast, stuck a needle into it and biopsied it, sent that biopsy to a pathologist. That pathologist is putting it through the pickling process that Virchow used 162 years ago tonight. And tomorrow, they're going to look at it under a microscope, a 2012 version of a light microscope. And they're going to say, this looks just like what those Germans call cancer in 1850. All right? Now, that 8 millimeter lesion in that woman's breast that looks like cancer may not be inherently programmed to grow, metastasize, spread, and kill that woman. Essentially, this is racial profiling in pathology, folks. Okay, It looks like something that was bad, therefore it must be bad. And we cure a whole bunch of folks of cancer who don't need to be cured. In prostate cancer, it's 50 to 60 percent of men with localized disease for sure. Some people actually think it's higher. In breast cancer, it's 10 to 30 percent. I, th I tend to think it's closer to 10 than 30, but m some of my friends think it's 30. And even in lung cancer, with lung cancer screening, we cure a few cancers that if never diagnosed and never treated would have never bothered the person. We, we hear a lot about men dying, so many men dying with prostate cancer, but not of prostate cancer. And you, you just suggested that, if I understood you correctly, that 10%, um, it could be, what, what kinds of percentages do we have? For prostate for, cancer? For other cancers. Oh, uh, 10 to 30% of breast cancer, uh, probably 5 to 10% of lung cancers, uh, I don't have a number for you on brain tumors, which was the original mm -hmm. question. I People don't dying a, with them, not of them. That's right. I don't have a number for you on colon cancer. The ones that mm -hmm. we have, you know, in cervical cancer, there's some cervical cancers that clearly 
uh, will regress if left alone. Uh, and so I can't give you a percentage, but mm -hmm. there are some overdiagnosis in all of these. Now, for example, mm -hmm. in breast cancer, I can with good conscience recommend that we treat all of these women who we diagnose with breast cancer, because even though I cure some people who don't need to be cured, I have studies to show that I do cure some people who need to be cured. Okay. Okay. In prostate cancer, I really don't have good studies to show that I'm curing people who need to be cured. Wow. Okay, but in breast cancer I have it, in colon cancer I have it, even in cervix cancer I have it. Uh, so for our radio audience, I want to remind you that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Today we are speaking with Dr. Otis Brawley, noted physician and chief medical officer for the American Cancer Society. He is discussing the mistreatment of patients by the American healthcare system. So, uh, uh, another, uh, another question from the audience here is uh, about technology and how it drives costs, it drives equipment, yeah. it's taken up, it's, widely, it's taken up for one purpose, which may be a good purpose at the start, but then widely disseminated. Yeah, technology is a huge problem. Actually, one of the statistics I usually use in the long version of my talk is if you compare Canada to the United States on a per 100,000 basis, we have three times as many CAT scanners and five times as many MRI scanners as they do in Canada. People always talk about the lines for people having to wait to get scanned in Canada, but they forget the fact, again, if you look at if you look at life expectancy of UN countries, Canada's ten, we're number forty nine. You know, we're in good country, we're we're in good company, we're right next to Albania in terms of life expectancy. Uh, but uh, the when much of the issue much of the issue in healthcare and how we've gotten into so much of this is we have not had wisdom in the use of these new technologies. When we develop a new technology, be it coronary artery bypass grafting, it can be even putting tubes in kids' ears, or it can be the MRI scanner. We overuse that technology. We think we're doing a good service by overusing that technology, but ultimately, very frequently, we end up figuring out that we are not. And I have, uh, this, this works, this is a place where I think everyone participates is because I, uh, a neurologist I know said, if only there could be real standards that would be applied because I'm ordering, I'm ordering MRIs on people, you know, people come in with migraines. I know they have yeah. migraines, yes. yeah. but I have to order the MRI because yeah. it's there. No one ever got sued or got into trouble because they ordered a test. You only get in trouble because you decided not to order the test, which is really unfortunate. Uh, you know, coming over here today on the plane, I read a paper which estimates that 1% of all cancers in the United States are due to medical radiation. So this overuse of CT scans and x-rays is actually a serious issue. That, that's a very sobering statistic. So. Um, you know, there was a study that came out last week from, uh, from Stanford where they reviewed, uh, I want to say, 80,000, know, they looked at a gross number, a huge number of meta-analyses, and concluded that in the studies that found a big effect, which they defined as greater than a five times over the control group, that in subsequent studies, almost more than 90% of them, that big effect went away. And this really, uh, I thought, got at the heart of, on the patient side, of the, the longing for the silver bullet and the attention paid to those, I mean, journalists bear, do journalists bear, 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 uh, bear some of the responsibility here too? Well, well, I won't blame journalists as much as I will blame doctors. You know, in order to get tenure in a major American medical school nowadays, you have to have a national and international reputation. And it's easier to get a national and international reputation through the New York Times than through the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, so there's a lot of, every, every medical school has a press person who's out there pushing studies from the university. We actually saw this recently when at Harvard uh, there was a uh, group of people who uh, released a press release that was actually uh, talking about some stuff from the women's health trial 
and uh, the actual investigators who wrote the paper publicly backed away from the press release and criticized the university for over-promoting it. And uh, that, that, is, that is a real problem. I'll tell you my concern, the number of health journalists in the country is going down with the decline of print media. You know, I'm more and more, I'm getting calls from people from mid middle of the country newspapers, and they ask me a question. I have to explain to them that incidence is getting the disease and mortality is dying from it. And then I question them a little bit further, and the day before they were doing street crime stories. You know, I used to have, 10 years ago, I used to routinely get challenged by health reporters who knew what sensitivity and specificity and positive predictive value was. By the way, one of the people who was instrumental in getting that, uh, getting those uh, doctors to actually come out and say, this is being exploited, this is, this is, this is good science, but it's not really important science, was Bob Bazell from NBC News. He's one of the last of the real health reporters. And unfortunately, we're losing that uh, as uh, the news media changes, the health reporters are going away. Um, here's a question related to uh, end of life care. Um, how do we change our country's approach to death and dying, given its rampant politic politicization um, and religious, if I'm reading this correctly, religious intricacies? I don't have an answer to every question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you, I, I will tell you that, you know, this, and this is by no means a scientific experiment. Some of the most religious patients I have ever had are some of the most fearful of dying. Okay, I, I will tell you that, but I don't have an answer to that question. But I do think that we, as a country, need to have a good conversation about death and dying, and scaring people with words like death panels is not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, do doctors get kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies? You had a really yeah. quite an amazing profile in your book. Yeah, like in my profile. book I talked about erythropoietin. Uh, which uh, uh, Amgen Pharmaceuticals was doing bundling, is what they called it. You would think of it as volume discounting. And you see doctors, and this is changing, health, health reform is actually changing this. Uh, doctors in oncology, in nephrology, and rheumatology make a lot of money off of the markup on the drugs. You know, I pay I pay wholesale and I sell at retail on drugs that we administer in our office. And with erythropoietin, the wholesale price went down as the volume of drug that the doctors use went down. A four-person practice who used a little bit of erythropoietin in 2007 would probably lose money because they had to pay a nurse to inject it. But a four-person practice that used a lot of erythropoietin because of bundling could make three quarters of a million dollars in one year. Year if they used a lot of erythropoietin. And this led to doctors looking for reasons why they could prescribe this drug because they needed to sp sell more and more to make more and more. And ultimately, um, Amgen did a series of studies to try to help their salespeople suggest reasons to use this drug. And unfortunately, uh, those studies actually showed that the drug actually stimulated cancer growth. As a matter of fact, I got in, a, in, one, in one of a moment that uh, Father Fallon would have been very proud of me. I released a daisy cutter at an FDA meeting when I referred to erythropoietin as miracle growth for cancer tumor fertilizer. <laughs> Front page above the fold, New York Times. Uh, Erythropoietin is incredibly limited. No one can get the drug now for cancer unless they sign a statement saying, I realize I'm not being treated with curative intent, number one, and you cannot use it on people who have cervical cancer, breast cancer, head and neck cancer. Those were the tumors where it was actually found to stimulate tumor growth. Uh, Amgen has not had to pay for what they were doing except on Wall Street where their stock has gone down. Uh, but uh, that's an example of just, that's a very egregious example. It's still, to me, very raw emotionally. Uh, 
and doctors and the drug company were very much at fault. So, oh, sorry. Um, several, it seems like I, I've read a great deal about trying to reduce, reduce cost through um, checklists and so forth. Yeah. And uh, Peter Provenost has a pretty simple five, five point plan. How, how much of, the, of a difference can, for holding doctors and hospitals' feet to the fire make in, uh, in reducing patient harm when they're in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. I was actually talking to an engineer uh, before this started, and it's amazing how much, in terms of engineering principles, could be applied in the healthcare setting that could improve patient outcomes, and they never have been applied. The system has got this subtle form of corruption, and everybody's been able to make money off of it. And very few people have felt this urge or inclination to actually try to make the system more efficient. You know, when we had lots of gas, when we had lots of gasoline, or lots of oil and lots of gasoline, and gas cost 30 cents a gallon, it was okay to have cars that, you know, got eight, 10 miles to the gallon. Now that gas is more expensive, we're trying to get much more fuel efficient. Our uh, vehicles, medicine is very much the same way. Maybe medicine will get more efficient as margins get smaller and smaller. But we have not applied the engineering principles of organization. The electronic medical record, which is something that's in legislation right now, is actually, I think, gonna help us an awful lot. But uh, just, Management, just plain, ordinary, good management principles have rarely been applied in medicine. And what about government, government requirements to reduce the rate of readmission to hospitals or will withhold Medicare uh, funding for that readmit, uh, that unnecessary readmission? I support paying for uh, a system where reimbursement is somehow geared to quality outcomes, but I'm also concerned that there's going to be this lady who really needs to be admitted, and there's somebody in the middle of the night saying, I don't want her in our statistics. I'm worried about that. Hmm. Um, and I would imagine you're seeing that up close and personal at a large public hospital. I see that all the time. They, they uh, basically what happens is, they don't get admitted at the private hospital, and the family uh, at wit's end brings them down to the public hospital. They'll take anybody. So. But they've had all their long history of care at the private hospital. So we've uh, unfortunately reached the point in our program where there's time for only one, one last question. I'll, I'll ask you first, Dr. Brawley, is there anything you, that we didn't get to tonight that you'd like to get to? Otherwise, No, just... this has been great. Okay. So um, one, uh, I'm just sort of picking one here. You didn't mention the role of lobbyists and politicians in being in the forefront of drafting medical policy. What can be the done about system, that? The system is corrupt, and people who are responsible for it being corrupt are doctors, hospitals, lawyers, health insurances, patients, politicians, lobbyists, marketing people. <laughs> everybody is responsible for this and everybody needs to be, uh, I think, much more focused on trying to practice medicine in a rational way. Some of us who are, call ourselves professionals need to realize that the definition of a a professional is someone who puts the welfare of their patient or client above their own welfare, because many doctors have actually, you know, the erythropoid, an example, that's many doctors being terribly unprofessional. Our thanks to Dr. Otis Brawley, Professor of Medicine at Emory University, Chief Medical Officer and Executive Vice President of the American Cancer Society and co-author of How We Do Harm, A Doctor Breaks Ranks About Being Sick in America. We also thank our audiences here and on the radio. This program has been generously underwritten by the California Healthcare Foundation. We also want to remind everyone that copies of Dr. Brawley's book, How We Do Harm, are on sale in the lobby, and he will be pleased to sign them in this room immediately following the program. 
I'm Lisa Alaferis from KQED, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>